This morning, I want you to come with me for a moment to the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And imagine that it is a typical warm spring day on the Sea of Galilee. It's about 90 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. And you've been following an itinerant preacher wandering around the countryside for maybe a few weeks by now. And the things you have seen could fill a book. You've seen paralyzed people begin to walk again. You have seen demon-possessed people set free. You have seen people who have seizures be cured. People who are dealing with chronic pain no longer have pain. You have seen sick people healed. And, and the crowds. The crowds are like nothing you've ever seen. It's not that they're big, though they're big. It's who's in those crowds. There are pagans from the Decapolis, those Gentile heathen sinners that you wouldn't walk, you'd cross the street to avoid. There's the, the wealthy elite from Jerusalem who came down from the mountains to go walk with you little peons in Galilee and follow this itinerant preacher. And then there's the farmers and fishermen that you know from the villages in Galilee. But there's these other people, not just the poor, not just the sick, though there are those too. There's well, there's the sinner kind of people who are following this teacher too. The kind of people that you would normally keep a safe distance from because you don't want to get messed up in their kind of life. But here they all are following this Jesus. And then Jesus climbs a hill and the crowd follows and he sits down and he begins to teach them finally. Now, there are some scholars, when they look at the Sermon on the Mount, who have argued that it's not really a sermon. It's just random sayings of Jesus that Matthew threw together willy-nilly, all hodgepodge, and there's no greater point or structure or anything to it. You should just look at a few verses and ponder them in a wonderful Christian spirituality sort of way. But don't assume they fit together in any way. Um, that's stupid. So I just wanted you to know. In case you wondered, we're not blunt at all in this church. We just call it like we see him. So Dallas Willard makes a point that if, if Jesus was doing, if, if Matthew did that, then he did an amazing job because the sermon follows a very clear structure and seems to be answering two main points. What is the good life and how do you live that good life? These are really the questions that Jesus is trying to answer. And so these, these scholars, though, who think that Maybe it's just all thrown together. They will also tell you, though, this is the most important teaching in the New Testament. Because if you want to know how to live as a Christian, this is the place the church has gone over and over again to say, this is how Jesus calls us to live. These three chapters, Matthew 5 through Matthew 7, are the core of our Christian theology and ethics of how do we live day to day with each other and with our world. But those same scholars who think they're thrown together willy-nilly will say... Well, the whole sermon's just an enigma. They don't know what to do with it. So I wouldn't really listen to them too much. So we want to find people who actually know what to do with the sermon. And so if, if you study it long enough, you'll discover that pretty much every great theologian you know has written about it. So Dallas Willard has a whole book all on these three chapters. It's like 400 pages long. It takes a long time to read. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was celebrating the 75th anniversary of his death, this year, he was killed by the Nazis 75 years ago. His book, The Celebration of Discipline, is really a study on the Sermon on the Mount. It's a short introduction, Sermon on the Mount, conclusion. That's it. This is the most influential three chapters in all of Scripture that you can read, apart from the resurrection accounts, because without those, what's the point, right? But if you want to know if the resurrection is true, how do I live? This is where you go. And so today, I want you to join the crowds as they listen to Jesus. Because I think this is where the scholars go wrong. They don't get the context right in that they read it as a book and they forget it's a sermon. And sermons aren't written out of, out of a context. They're written to a particular people. They're spoken to a particular people in that situation. And they weren't there. So think about what we know has just happened. From the few verses before Matthew 5, we're told that Jesus is healing people and he's setting demons out and all that kind of stuff. And now he gives a sermon. So as he's speaking, the people are remembering when he was comforting that person who was mourning just a few hours ago. And he, they remember when, when that guy who was so meek that he was scared of his own shadow talked to Jesus that suddenly he wasn't so scared and he had confidence again because he knew who he was in God. They remember that. 
And so when Jesus speaks these Beatitudes, they're not random sayings. He's speaking to the things they have just seen him do. So let's listen together to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount and being at Matthew 5, verse 1. Here are these words of our Lord. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, help us to know your ways. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So the Sermon on the Mount is trying to answer these two key questions in life. What is the good life and how do we begin to live it? The first few chapters answer the first question, or the first few verses, excuse me, answer the, answer the first question. And really, it's an assumption that Jesus makes of what the good life is, and that the good life is to live in and under the reign or rule of God, to be part of the kingdom of God. That's what the good life is. That's how we were made to live. In fact, the entire Old Testament is all about how is God going to reestablish his rule over the world after Adam and Eve messed everything up. They eat the fruit, they get kicked out of the garden, they're no longer living under the rule of God. Their job was to cultivate the garden, expand it so all of the world would live under God's rule, and they failed. So God comes to, to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, I'll show you how to live under my, under my rule, you'll live so well in that way that other people will want to live like you too and they'll follow me and the whole world will begin to live under my reign. That's the goal of the people of Israel. They're not very good at it. And rather than the nations flocking to Israel to learn how to live the good life they live with God, Israel worships other gods. And eventually, they get destroyed. And the temple where God lives gets destroyed. And the throne God sits on gets taken away, and the Ark of the Covenant has never been seen since. And by the time of Jesus' day, the question for the Jews is, how do we get back into that kingdom? 
How, what do we have to do? What, when is God going to act so that his reign will come on earth and we can live under his authority again rather than under the authority of Rome? How do we live under the reign, the rule, the kingdom of God? How do we get back into that kingdom? The religious people in Jesus' day had an answer. Whether you're the Pharisees or the Sadducees, their answer was, follow God like we do and then you get to be in the kingdom. So follow all of the rules that we've made, offer all the sacrifices we tell you, and then you'll be good enough and you'll be welcome into the kingdom of God. You can live under the reign of God. You do those things and then you can experience the kingdom. Jesus actually reverses that order. Jesus says, let me show you what it's like to live under the kingdom and then I'll tell you how to do it. Because the kingdom is a place where the sick get made well, where the lame walk, where the blind see, where the deaf hear, where the dead are raised, and those are the things Jesus does first. He says, now that you have a taste of my kingdom, now that you know what my reign is like, let me show you how to live in it. Let me show you how to enter into that kingdom. And he gives us the Beatitudes. And this is where us religious folk mess it up, I think. And this is Dallas Willard's insight. I will take no credit, but I think he's right. We mess it up because we read the Beatitudes and we see it as a to-do list. These are the people who've earned the right to be in the kingdom of God. The poor in spirit, well, they've done something that makes them worthy to enter into the kingdom of God. Those who are merciful, they've done something so they'll get shown mercy and they'll be welcomed in God's kingdom. And on and on we go. And we've turned the Beatitudes, a list of blessings, into a to-do list. We've turned the blessing of God into tasks we have to accomplish so God will love us. Think how messed up that is. Sometimes we do a little better and we've spiritualized the Beatitudes in our to-do list. And so now we don't have to actually be poor in spirit. Luke makes it a little more blunt. He says, blessed are the poor. And then we didn't like that so much. We stick to Matthew. So we can just, you know, feel our poverty of our spirit that, oh, I'm so bad and then maybe God will love me because I feel bad about all my sin. Or I know if I just have compassion for people who mourn, I don't have to have any grief myself. I'll just feel compassion for people who mourn and then I'll be worthy of God's love. And we try to spiritualize it to make it easier for us because Who wants to be the persecuted one and the mourning one? No one wants to be those people, so we try to spiritualize it to get out of some of that because we've made a blessing into a to-do list. Which is silly because what's the one thing we have learned in all of Scripture as we read through it? Can we do anything to be worthy of God's love? No. No matter how, no matter what's on your to-do list, no matter how long your to-do list is, no matter how good you are at checking things off your to-do list to be worthy of God's love, it's not going to be enough. And I want to let you in on a secret of why it's not enough. It's not that you sin, although you do. That's part of it. But the bigger reason is this. You can't be worthy of something that's already been given to you. You don't have to earn something you've already been given You don't get gifts because you're worthy of them. That's your wages. You get gifts because you don't have to earn it. It's a gift. You are loved simply because God loves you, not because of anything that you've done or will do or could do. There is no to-do list that will make you worthy of God's love. It's already been given. You don't have to earn it. That's the problem we make the Beatitudes into a to-do list. Let me also suggest why we can miss some of that, though, is... We have to put ourselves back into the first century with these people who are around Jesus to understand the power of the Beatitudes. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus is in the wilderness. He's performing miracles. He has all these people gathered around him. And we're just going to be blunt, because I already used the word stupid in the sermon. We're just going to be blunt about who these people are, okay? These are the spiritual losers of their day, most of them. They're bad at following God. They're bad at it. When Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, he didn't mean some sort of abstract, oh, they feel bad about their sin, people. He meant, blessed are the people who are bad at spiritual things. They're poor in all the spiritual stuff. They're bad at it. 
They're not good at going to church, and they're not good at praying, and they're not good at tithing, and they probably say bad words sometimes, and they got lots of other things that they struggle with too. They're bad at all the religious stuff, and, and Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the bad religious people. Theirs is the kingdom of God. They're welcome in God's kingdom too. I mean, think about who Jesus hangs out with. He hangs out with tax collectors, which we think of IRS agents, but you have to think more of criminal extortionists and traitors. That's who Jesus hangs out with. That's how the Jews viewed tax collectors in his day. He hangs out with prostitutes. You don't see a lot of church people bragging about their prostitute friends, do you? Just Tony Campolo, he does. <laughs> but not many of us are bragging about all the prostitutes we hang out with, right? But Jesus hung out with prostitutes. He's hanging out with divorced people who are living in sin and he doesn't go around telling them they got to get their life in order for to love them. He just loves them anyway. He hangs out with violent people. Two of his disciples are, arm, are arming themselves for armed rebellion against Rome. How many of you are stockpiling weapons to rebel against the U.S. government? Those are Jesus' buddies. He hangs out with the weirdos. If you're stockpiling weapons to your balance U.S. government, I might want to know that after I said you were a weirdo. So let's talk quietly after church as I think about this for a minute. I didn't think that through ahead of time. We can talk. But he hangs out with the people who gave up on church, who don't go to synagogue, who don't know the difference between Moses and the Messiah or David and Daniel. They are the spiritual losers. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is open to you. The point of the Beatitudes is not that there's anything you have to do to be welcomed into the kingdom of God, but that the people that the world thinks are outside of God's blessing are actually in it. Those who are too meek to get their way, those who are too pure to ever bend the rules, those who are so merciful that they get taken advantage of and we think they're naive and stupid because they're just too merciful for other people. The ones who always get caught in the middle of conflicts because they're trying to find common ground and make peace and everyone can't stand them because both sides are mad at them. All the people that no one thinks are blessed are the ones God is blessing. They're the ones God's welcoming into his kingdom. But I also want you to notice here at least, in Luke it's a little different, but in Matthew, in this sermon... Jesus is not saying that religious people can't be a part of the kingdom of God either. He's not saying that the, the wealthy in spirit, those who do all of the prayer and they're in church every single week and they tithe and they serve, they're not welcome. He's not saying that. Everyone assumed that the religiously successful and financially successful people of the world were in the kingdom of God because clearly God was already blessing them, so they must be welcomed by God. Look at everything God gave them. The question was, does God care about those losers over there? And Jesus says God cares about the losers and the outcasts and the flakes and the freaks and the people who don't quite fit in. They're welcome too. They're welcome even before they get their lives figured out. Just as they found their healing in Jesus in the miracles, they find the way into the kingdom through Jesus too. Because it is not about their goodness, it is about his goodness. It is not about their faithfulness and their belief, it is about God's faithfulness to them. Anyone can have access to the good life of the kingdom. Which means for you and me, these spiritual losers and freaks and weirdos of our day, or maybe that's just me, but I'll be one of them today, they're welcome too. So if you're someone who who grew up in a Christian home and then you rebelled pretty well. I mean, you really rebelled. <laughs> like you had a checklist and you got them all down. And you bear the physical and emotional scars of that rebellion. You're welcome in God's kingdom too. The door is still open. Or maybe you've been dealing with an addiction in your life and it's, maybe it's alcohol or painkillers and it's tearing your life apart and you feel like it has control of you. You're welcome in God's kingdom just that way too. Maybe you're dealing with mental health issues and depression or bipolar disorder or anxiety is ruling your life and you know it and it is affecting the family around you and you just can't get it under control and you think, how could God love someone like me? Well, the kingdom's open to people like you too. Or maybe, 
maybe you look like an outward success. You have climbed the ladder, you know just how to dress right, and you, you, have, you have the picture-perfect life, and yet you know it's driven by your perfectionism and your workaholism, and it's all a facade because really you're destroying the, the people around you because you don't have time for any of them. Because your work and your perfectionism is ruling you, and you can't love people when you always have to be right, and you can't ever make a mistake. The kingdom's open to you too. Someone's riding the elevator. We'll see who it is when they walk by. I'll let you know. <laughs> or maybe you grew up in church and you went to Christian school and catechism classes and youth group and you know all of the right Christian answers to all of the questions because you had to memorize the catechism all 120 plus questions and answers from third grade to fifth grade and you did it because you like to get things right. And you have issues in your life about not, not being wrong about stuff and you look a lot like me. The kingdom is open to you too. But it's not because you're so great at knowing the answers. It's because God already loved you before you knew the answers, before you even knew the questions you should have been asking. Because it is about his love for you more than it is about your worthiness of it. This is the message of the Beatitudes. You're welcome in the kingdom, no matter how messed up you are, or how good you are, you are welcome here. For those of us in the kingdom, then the next question is, well, if we're in the kingdom, what does it mean for us? And Jesus says, well, don't lose your saltiness and be a light in the world. The easiest thing to do, if you're someone who wants to follow God, and you live in American Christianity, the easiest thing to do is to decide, without even thinking about it, to fill your life with other believers doing believery things together. And so you come to church every week, and you volunteer at the church, and you're in a small group. In our church, you might be in a small group, a 729 group, and a discipleship group. So you got like three meetings a week just to think about Jesus with other people from, from our church. And you're volunteering places and you're here on Wednesdays and you go to the prayer group and you got all of this stuff to do, right? And pretty soon, the only people you know are already following Jesus too. And I would just point one thing out to you. Well, that's how I grew up, first of all. Let me just say, that's how I grew up. When I was growing up, that was considered, from what I picked up, that's not about what the adults thought, but as a kid, what I picked up is that's what it meant to live an ideal Christian life, to always be with other Christian people. To live a life sheltered from the rest of the world, cocooned from any of that polluting influence, safe in a Christian subculture. So we listened to the right kind of Christian music. By the time I was in college, I'm old enough, they didn't have a lot of Christian radio stations before then, but late high school, college. We were in church, well, I was in church every Sunday morning and night, and what, we always went on vacation, and we learned one year, never go to a Baptist church on a Sunday morning, because it'll go three hours. And we snuck out in the middle, but we still went back at night because you don't miss morning or night when I was a kid. We did it all. And, I'll, and Christian school, Monday through Friday, Christian college, it was a great way to grow up. It was wonderful. But I do not remember many times having conversations with anyone about the importance of other people hearing about Jesus. Maybe it never came up because literally the only people I knew from the time I was born until I started working at Ole Taco in Holland, the only people I knew until then went to church already. I did not know anyone who did not. Not because there were not church, non-church going people in my life. It's that my life was structured so I would never meet them. It's hard to care about people who are simply an idea to you because you've never actually met them face to face. When you've done everything to insulate yourself from having to know and love and care about people who are far from God. You can't be a light to the world if you spend your life living under a bowl, is Jesus' point. You can't be a light to the world if your light's under a bowl, no one will see it. You can't be the salt of the earth if you never get out of the salt shaker. You can be a really good religious person that way, but you cannot be a follower of Jesus. You can be a really good religious person 
by sheltering yourself from all of the non-believers around you and living in a Christian subculture and only hanging out with other Christian people, you can be a really good religious person that way. You can be a really good churchgoer, and churchgoing people will love you. But you are not actually following Jesus when you do that. Because Jesus said to go and make disciples. And you can't make disciples if you don't know anyone isn't already a disciple. You cannot follow Jesus if that's the way you do it. By sheltering yourself from everyone in the world who isn't, doesn't already know God. You simply can't do it. We have to be intentional to be the salt in the world. Now, that doesn't mean you should look like the world because then you're not salt anymore. You've lost your saltiness. And so you cannot go in the world saying, I want non church people to think I'm cool and awesome. And you have to be you, a follower of Jesus, loving people who don't yet know Jesus and following the ways of Jesus. That's what we'll talk about in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. But I will tell you, two things will happen if you start living the way Jesus did. If you start living, seeking to know and bless and welcome and love people who don't know God. First thing that's going to happen is your compassion for people who are broken will grow. Because when we don't live according to the ways of God, life gets messier. Not because they are any more morally better or worse than us. Just if you don't follow the ways of God, you're not living according to the ways God made you to work. And so your life will be messier. And there's more brokenness and hurt, and you'll have more compassion for people who are hurting because you'll love people who are hurting. It will grow your heart to be bigger than it used to be. Second thing that will happen is if you truly try to live that way, you will crave and long for more intentional time with other believers. Not to shelter yourself, but because you need to be reminded why you do this, and you need to be inspired for it. You want to be in worship every week, and you want to be in a, in a small group or a discipleship group, because you'll need spiritual friends who can encourage you and cheer you on, because it's hard work. And the sad thing is, you will probably find if you do it well, church people who don't have that same heart for Jesus' mission, who are not following Jesus but love church, won't like you as much. And they will criticize you. And they will be upset with you because you'll be hanging out with people that look a little different than you hang out with now, maybe. Or at least that are living differently than hang out with now. And they'll wonder, why do you do that? And you might invite them to church, and church won't be as clean and safe as it used to be. And some people won't like that as much. And they'll get upset with you. And so you'll need people who are on the same mission with you to go, it's worth it to keep going. You'll want that community with one another. That desire will grow in you. And it will be worth it for this simple reason that Jesus says at the very end of our passage today. Because it is worth anything for people to see God's glory through you. And if you live on mission for God to reach people who don't know God with the, with the love that God has for them, God's glory will shine and they will be changed and there is no greater joy you'll ever experience than seeing a life changed because they saw the love and glory of God at work in you. May you believe this gospel and go forth to live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we confess today that it is easy for all of us to choose to live in a Christian bubble. It is easier to choose to be religious than to follow your Son. It is easier to see your blessings as a to-do list than to acknowledge that it is a free gift for us and for those that make us uncomfortable or who we think are living in weird ways and we don't understand, Father, but it is a gift for all. Help us today to accept that gift and to cherish and rejoice in that gift and to share it with others as well. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.